This lecture is about the constant modulus algorithm, and in particular, I'll be talking about the motivation. Why is it that we use CMA or the constant modulus algorithm? So we need CMA for a few reasons. One of them would be to recover timing of our signal. Another one would be able to eliminate distortion or reduce distortion that was introduced in our signal. And we would also be using CMA in order to separate uh, multiplex signals on different polarization states. So you can see that these are uh, very important functions that we can get with the CMA. And what I'm going to be talking about in particular during this uh, sequence of presentations is talking about the one-dimensional variety of CMA. So this does not cover the two-dimensional that will be used for polarization states. I'd like to just talk about the 1D example to give you a feeling for how the algorithm works and the extension to two dimensions is pretty straightforward. So this is in the 1D case. This is where we're very good at treating timing recovery and dealing with distortion. And it's exploited in our laboratory assignment for single polarization transmission. For further reading, again, I won't be uh, covering it in this lecture, here is the 2 to D variety where you can actually, we will be using it in the laboratory for our multiplex dual polarization experiment, but I'll just be discussing today the 1D. And, and the 2D separates out the two polarization states, uh, uh, but again, the concept is the same as what we'll be discussing for the 1D. So let's start with a receiver in general. What is the form of a receiver for a digital communication signal. You know, once we've got it into the electrical, do electrical domain, what do we do with our received signal? And this is a very classic optimal receiver, uh, which has a filter. Makes sense. I'm going to filter the noise, reduce the noise as much as possible, and then I'm going to sample it. And this T represents the symbol time. And so, although I have an analog waveform which is coming in, which I'm filtering to, to eliminate noise, at some point I sample this, I sample it once, I have one sample per symbol, and then I use that sample in order to make a decision. And remember, I can use threshold detection to make a simple decision process. So, in theory, you know, one sample per symbol is enough. Now, in a commercial receiver, they will have a dedicated clock recovery circuit in order to determine when is it that I should be doing this sampling in order to recover the best possible test statistic, as we call this, in order to make my determination of what is the most likely symbol to have been sent. These circuits in these uh, commercial receivers assure that this is sampling is taking at the optimal time. And because we're taking it at the optimal time, then one sample per symbol, that's the one SPS, one sample per symbol, is enough for detection. However, we're going to be using a laboratory and test equipment to see many of the concepts in optical coherent detection. For that reason, we have to deal with timing recovery in a way that's different from what happens in commercial receivers. So we're not going to do a formal clock recovery. What we're going to do is we're going to exploit the CMA algorithm in order to do that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use a real-time oscilloscope that captures and digitizes my analog signal. So the first thing I do comes in, I capture it and I digitize it, and I'm going to use oversampling. I'm not going to use one sample per symbol, but I'm going to oversample to the extent that I can, uh, depending on the speed of my transmission of my signal and the sampling speed of my real-time oscilloscope, but for sure I'm going to need a couple samples per symbol in order to overcome the fact that I, I have no clock recovery system. And so for this scenario of signal timing recovery in a laboratory environment, then the CMA is a great tool to be able to do this timing recovery. So I said it's also good at dealing with distortion. And when we deal with distortion in a digital communication system, what we're talking about is equalization. 
This is a linear filter that is used to equalize, to mitigate the distortion, to, to equalize the channel, to try to make the channel look as if it was an all-pass channel that basically doesn't touch the data signal. In truth, the signal has some impairments, it distorts the signal, and now I'm talking about digital signal processing that tries to overcome that to correct for those vagaries which occurred during the transmission. How do we do equalization? Well, there's it's a very vast uh, area. Uh, but in order to equalize, I often need information. I need to know what was transmitted at some interval of time, know what was truly transmitted, exploit the fact I know what was transmitted in order to figure out what exactly the signal is doing, uh, what this channel is doing to my signal. So often in equalization, we use a training sequence. This is a known transmitted sequence that we exploit. For instance, on uh, many wireless standards, for instance for Wi-Fi, uh, there will be a preamble for every packet which is transmitted. And so every wireless transmitter you buy on the 802.11 uh, standard will always have the same exact transmitted sequence at the beginning of every packet so that the receiver can estimate what's going on in the wireless channel and compensate for it by designing an appropriate equalization filter. So at the receiver we can actually directly estimate the channel or we can just calculate the linear filter taps uh, using this knowledge of the transmitted si signal. The downside of this approach is, of course, that there's overhead. Because in a certain instant of time, not all of the information I'm processing is useful data. Some of it is this training that is not sending me the video I'm trying to download. And therefore, you know, my effective net bit rate is a bit lower because of this overhead. It's a trade-off, and uh, but this is a downside of using a training sequence. Pardon me. There are other solutions known as blind methods. A blind method is a way of creating an equalizer, even though I don't have this side information of a training sequence. Instead of using knowledge of the transmitted sequence, I use characteristics of the signal that I can exploit. And that's what we do in CMA. CMA is a blind method for equalization. When we do blind methods of adaptation without knowledge of the training sequence, uh, we often use a sto stochastic descent that adaptively finds uh, the optimal taps for the linear filter. This is a noisier solution. The blind method is noisier than the training sequence, but the upside is you have very low overhead. There's no overhead for this. Well, there, there's a little bit of overhead because you have to do this stochastic descent. It takes you a little while to get to the right ones, but um, generally it's, it's still a, a good approach. So constant modulus, we use it for timing recovery. We use it for equalization. The algorithm takes in oversampled signal, so predicated on the use of this constant modulus for, re for timing recovery in particular is the fact that I'm going to take advantage of the oversampling. So I put in oversampled signal, but I output one sample per symbol. So effectively, inside of the algorithm, there is something that is uh, forcing the output to give the output at that ideal sampling time. So the net effect is sort of equivalent to having a timing recovery circuit, the equivalent of having optimal timing. So at the same time that I'm doing this adaptation that allows me to do the timing recovery, it's also doing an equalization act. It's, again, a blind equalization. There's no training sequence required. And I said that blind systems exploit some characteristic of the modulation format. And here, right in the name, we know what characteristic it is of the modulation format that I exploit. And it is the fact that the modulated signal has a constant modulus. So QPSK is an excellent example of a modulation for, format with a constant modulus, because QPSK has the same power for all symbols which are transmitted. They're all transmitted 
at the same power. What distinguishes one symbol from another in QPSK is the phase of that, uh, that symbol. But the amplitude is the same for all of them. So the modulus is the same. So when I'm transmitting, I expect at my receiver that everything I receive will have the same modulus. And if it doesn't, well, I can use that as an error criteria to try and force my signal to get back the form it had when it was transmitted. So this algorithm, as it forces the signal received to have a constant modulus, in effect is correcting for bandwidth limitation effects. And it is uh, counteracting something like intersymbol interference, so that when my data signal goes through a channel with this limited bandwidth, it will create a dispersion of the pulse, which will lead to overlapping in uh, symbols and lead to intersymbol interference, which will deteriorate the performance of my communication system. So the constant modulus algorithm is a way to do equalization to mitigate this effect.